Hi folks, and welcome to week 12 of this mini lectures. This week, we're talking about the onset of the worst economic crisis of the 20th century and its companion ecological disaster, the Dust Bowl. In the first half of 1929, every economic indicator pointed to a roaring economy. In the final years of the 1920s, steel production, building construction, retail turnover, automobiles registered, and even railway receipts advanced from record to record. The growth was astonishing. The combined net profits of 536 manufacturing and trading companies showed an increase in the first six months of 1929 alone of roughly 37% over 1928's totals, itself a record-setting year. The United States enjoyed the highest standard of living in the world, and its industrial output over the decade had doubled. There was a massive speculative boom in both stocks and real estate, with economic exuberance overcoming any real caution. And as a cautionary note, Florida's real estate market was bumping, and that is usually always a bad sign for any economic bubble. The economist John Kenneth Galbraith describes what happens next. Imagine standing in a glass house, in a greenhouse. Glass ceilings and windows create a hothouse growing environment, one where plants can thrive beyond outside environmental constraints. You can grow tomatoes in January in a glass house in Montana if you do it right. Now, imagine standing in this 1920s greenhouse, looking at the fantastic growth, at the artificial growth, when a hailstorm comes ripping through and drops golf ball sized hail, shattering the glass roof and devastating the artificial growth before. If you've ever seen the face of a gardener or a farmer after the hailstorm destroys their plants and crops, that's what the entire American economy looked like. In October 1929, the stock market collapsed. The president of Chase Bank stated, quote, We are reaping the natural fruit of the orgy of speculation in which millions of people have indulged. It was inevitable because of the tremendous increase in the number of stockholders in recent years that the number of sellers would be greater than ever when the boom ended and selling took the place of buying. The root causes of the collapse were the root issues in the American economy. Overproduction and underconsumption, this time exacerbated by widespread speculation, which combined to lead to financial collapse. Take wheat production statistics for an example. In 1928, American wheat production was enormous and the harvest produced a surplus 250 million bushels of wheat that carried over into 1929, forcing the price of wheat down. Global harvests further pushed the price of wheat down, and Congress had to vote for an economic relief package for wheat farmers because they had become too successful. They produced too much wheat in too efficient of a manner, and the market glut of wheat push down prices. Similarly, the stock market was doing amazingly before the crash. Returns were high, and nearly every stock showed signs of growth. The iron and steel industries had doubled in value, paying huge dividends. This booming economy brought many people to investing, and given the returns paid by investing, Many people began buying stock on credit, borrowing money to purchase stock as the interest rates of the loan were lower than the rate of return and could be quite profitable, provided the market didn't crash. Consumerism also played into the crash. Imagine that you are a young homeowner in the early 1920s, perhaps a returned veteran, but with a solid job 
a decent house, and a growing family. Your job gives you the income to buy nice things for your new house. A car, a washing machine, an oven, etc. Most of these things are durable, high-ticket items, meaning that most people might buy one per decade. You only really need one at a time. By 1929, the purchasing of automobiles, appliances, and new home sales went into a steady decline after staying stable for years, but months before the crash. Overall production didn't slow, so the consumer market was oversupplied and underconsumed. However, people still looked positively on the situation. In September, before the crash, economist Irving Fisher proclaimed, quote, Stock prices have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. Boy, was he wrong. In early October 1929, there were already rumblings of an economic downturn. There was a short market bump before the ultimate crash, but the major issues in the American economy were evident, and investor confidence was shaken and rattled. Over the course of several days at the end of October, indicated here in the pink compared to the purple, the market dropped by more than one quarter and kept sliding. Banks and businesses began failing. In 1931, an average of 131 businesses went out of business every day in the United States. Banks began failing by the thousands between 30 and 33 and took many people's deposits with them, totaling in the billions of dollars. This was before the federal government insured all commercial banking deposits. The stock market, however, is not the economy. They are connected, but they are not the same thing. Share prices are not the best indicator of the health of an enterprise, merely just one diagnostic tool, such as a person's blood pressure. Much as a seriously sick person can have a fine blood pressure, an ailing industry can have a great stock price. In the 1920s, The American economy was getting sick, despite being the picture of health. The stock market reflected the structural economic conditions, which contributed to the economic crisis. Remember our discussion of economic inequality from week five. I'd encourage you to go back and review the mini lecture, but wealth inequality continued and worsened during the 1920s, concentrating at the top. A few statistics. Between 1923 and 1929, corporate profits increased by 62%, while dividends on stock increased by 65%. At the same time, worker income only went up by 11%. And in 1929, 71% of American families lived on less than $2,500 per year, which the U.S. government and the Census Bureau considered to be the basic stable family income. That's 71% of Americans living below income stability. This has serious ramifications for an economy based on consumerism, as many of the potential consumers did not have the means to buy enough stuff to drive the economy. Take a look at the table over here. This is the uh, total of wealth owned by income percentile. What this reflects is the share of wealth controlled by the top 20% and the bottom 20% of the population. You can see in 1910, the gap is pretty wide, 46% to 8%. That's, that's pretty wide. It, uh, it widens by the time of the Depression. The rich gain about 5%, and the bottom lose 3%. And in 
Economic crises have disproportionate impacts on people with less wealth as they generally lose the larger proportion of their wealth despite losing less overall. A millionaire might lose $100,000 of their wealth and still be fine. A poor family might lose $2,000 and have lost the overwhelming majority of their savings. When the market crashes, as it did in 1929, the wealthy, the upper class and the upper middle class in the U.S. slow down their investing. And this decreases the available capital for businesses to do the business things, like buy more raw materials, make more products, pay more workers more money, etc. Layoffs followed exacerbating the economic circumstances for those trapped at the bottom of the economic pyramid. Effectively, the economy began a downward slide that reached its low point in 1932 and 1933. Several economic statistics show the dramatic decline of the American economy secondary to the crash of 1929. Gross national product, the entire quantity of everything produced, sold, consumed, blah, 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 in the United States declined by a third by 1933. Automobile sales fell from 4.5 million in 1929 to 1.1 million units in 1933. U.S. Steel was only producing at 12% of its capacity in 1933. Blast furnaces had gone cold and stood empty. New construction dropped from 8.7 billion to 1.4 billion. That means that other industries, such as, you know, the timber industry or the steel industry, or home furnishings or however, are also similarly affected. Farm income drops from $11.3 billion to $4.8 billion. It's two-thirds drop. Wages paid drop from $12 billion to $7 billion. And unemployment rises from 3.2 to 16% in 1931 to 25 to 30% later on. This is a dire situation in the American economy. It is desperate, it is unlike anything that the nation had seen before. The Panic of 1873 and the Panic of 1893 were bad. This was horrible. All right, I think I'm going to close this mini lecture here, and we'll pick it up in a discussion of the Great Depression.